Hi everyone, thanks for making the left turn for today, Thursday, March 10th, 2016. I'm George Ferrar. Welcome back to the Jack's Left channel. Welcome back to History Jacksonville. I have a very special History Jacksonville for you today. Back in January of this year, I took this picture of the intersection of Laura and Forsyth Streets. Notice the marble bank, the Bisbee building directly to the right of it, and directly behind it, the old Florida Life Building designed by the renowned architect Henry J. Clutho. Uh, I've always been fascinated by these buildings as I have visited downtown, uh, and today we're going to do something unique. Let's take a look at the Marble Bank. Previously, this abandoned building at Warren Forsyth was the Mercantile Exchange Bank, and later it was Florida National Bank. Today, it's abandoned, but we're going to do something unique, because today, March 10th, 2016, it appears online as the Hall of Jacksonville History. I'm proud to bring to you here on the History Jacksonville series another show that looks at Jacksonville history. I'm going to talk about uh, our historical places, uh, and I'm going to talk about the changes that Jacksonville has been through over the past 100 years or so. But first, let's step out of the Hall of Jacksonville history. It's the 1920s, and it's the Florida National Bank. And we're out on Forsyth Street. And things are different on Forsyth Street in the early 20th century. It seems a lot busier. A lot of people hustling and bustling. Theaters, places to go to check out a movie, uh, and convenient banking. Uh, money and entertainment definitely goes hand in hand, especially in downtown Jacksonville in the 1920s. Uh, so much happening, so much going on, so much business, and so many choices of things to do all in one place. Look at all of those cars. Let's, let's kind of get out of the hustle and bustle for a moment. Go to a place that's a, a little more quiet. Hey, it's the old, old Jacksonville Public Library. This library, this old, old library, uh, no longer library, it was a Carnegie Library. It was uh, made possible by an industrialist named Andrew Carnegie. And after the Great Fire of 1901, uh, this library uh, was built. It was the first taxpayer-funded library in the state of Florida. And if you look at how small the building is, uh, and in a moment you're going to see what the what I call the old library, uh, what what th that was built to be, uh, and you'll see some interesting things. Uh, there's a lot of detail to this place. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, really what that it uh, has managed to hold uh, some of its unique characteristics throughout the years. Uh, now, this, for example, uh, is one of the columns uh, in the front of the library, the old, old library. Now let's look at the old library. Wow. Yes, in 1965, uh, the city of Jacksonville Duval County uh, built a new central library called the Hayden Burns Public Library. And uh, look at how big it is. Now, you'll see later on in the show the old Jacksonville City Hall, the old, old Jacksonville City Hall. And it occupied this block along with the Hotel Wendell. The tallest building in Jacksonville from 1926 to 1954 was the Barnett National Bank building. Barnett Bank started out as the Bank of Jacksonville, and it was named uh, Barnett Bank uh, after the founder died. 
And so this was the headquarters uh, for quite a long time for Barnett Bank. Later on, Barnett Bank was acquired by Nations Bank, which was quickly acquired by Bank of America. Uh, Barnett had moved their facilities to uh, what's now the Bank of America Tower uh, in the late 80s, early 1990s. And so all we have left is Jacksonville's tallest skyscraper. Of course, our current city policy is it sits abandoned. Uh, all these windows opened uh, to the elements. Uh, every once in a while, uh, at one spark, I had the opportunity to step inside the building into the general uh, area behind those windows. Uh, but they haven't really figured out quite what they want to do with it just yet. And uh, it was great, though, when they took the plywood off and there are windows now. So this is something that's something special. Uh, you know, modern skyscrapers came into being in the 1950s. Uh, we started to see them being built. Um, this is now known as the Aetna Building. Uh, when it was built, it was built for Prudential Insurance. It's on the South Bank. We'll talk more about the Acosta and the Main Street Bridge, uh, those bridges uh, later on in the show. Uh, but you can see where uh, you've got uh, certainly uh, more parking, uh, convenience uh, for people, and it's right near the highways. Okay, now downtown there was some building going on. Uh, this is the old Independent Life building that's being constructed in the 1950s. I'm not talking about what we now know as Wells Fargo uh, building out on the river uh, that later... Uh, it was built as the Independent Life Building. This was the first skyscraper for the Independent Life Company. And of course, now it sits, of course, abandoned as well. Its windows open to the elements. Uh, saw an excellent urban exploration uh, video by some folks uh, called The Proper People on YouTube. And uh, they, uh, they went into the building. Of course, you're not supposed to do that, not supposed to trespass. But these folks had gone inside this old skyscraper. Um, it no longer the Independent Life Building, of course. Uh, this uh, later on uh, uh, was constructed. Uh, what we, I will always know as the Independent Life Building, though it's changed uh, over the years to be MODIS and Wells Fargo. Uh, this is a view of it uh, from Friendship Park across the river. Um, so, you know, all these different different companies, all these different things happening. Uh, but definitely, uh, you know, of course, Independent Life isn't around anymore. Uh, here we have uh, the JEA headquarters, the headquarters of the Jacksonville Electric Authority. Now, it opened up as the Universal Marion Building in the early 1960s. A very unique building, has a very... Uh, it's very illustrious tenants, you know, a lot of different um, the people were involved. Ultimately, uh, the charter company uh, was the main uh, business in the building. Uh, illustrious man named uh, Raymond Mason, uh, a businessman, uh, ran a company. And there's a lot of information out there about, about the Universal Marion building, including an episode of History Jacksonville where I talk exclusively about the building. This is a picture of the revolving restaurant that for a period of time in the 1960s and early 1970s uh, was operating on the top of that building. Now here is a picture of it from the 1980s when it was known as a Charter Security Life building. This is the way I remember the building uh, growing up as uh, a kid in Arlington. You know, you'd go downtown, of course you'd see all these different places uh, and so, you know, now it's the Jackson Electric Authority headquarters. The JEA, interestingly enough, had also occupied the old uh, abandoned independent life building um, uh, after they moved onto the river. Speaking of on the river, we've got the Golf Life building. And what and to the left of it, what I remember as the Hilton Hotel. Uh, and, uh, you know, so more building was happening on the South Bank. Uh, on the other side of the river from downtown. So you have all these different insurance companies. You know, we were, for a while, I don't know if we could still say this, but we were known as the Hartford of the South. In 
if I had to name only one crown jewel of Jacksonville, it would be the Florida Theater. I first experienced the Florida Theater in the 1980s after it had reopened. Uh, and uh, I saw the Florida Ballet, and I saw the Nutcracker Ballet. Um, later on, um, I had the opportunity to visit the Florida Theater from time to time. Uh, and it was built in the Mediterranean Revival style, and here we see it under construction. And here we see it finished. Uh, and uh, you can see the sign alongside there and the marquee and, of course, uh, the cars. So something that, that is a unique place, something special, uh, a great theater uh, that managed to be preserved uh, and kept going and is currently utilized as a theater. There's a lot of history with the Florida Theater uh, and I'm glad that we've been able to hold on to that history because there have been other places, other theaters uh, here in Jacksonville that met the bulldozer, uh, that have been demolished. Uh, the Imperial Theater uh, was unique in that it had, uh, it had gotten uh, sound technology uh, back when sound was first being introduced into motion pictures, uh, it uh, was one of the first theaters in Jacksonville to get it. The Riverside Theater had it for a brief period of time, and then the equipment was moved here to the Imperial. Now, this is a unique theater because it's called the Arcade Theater. Now, it no longer stands, uh, and uh, it had openings uh, on two different streets, uh, a common hallway with two different box offices on two different streets. And uh, this, though, will not be how I remember the Arcade Theater, because later on it became the Center Theater. Uh, it changed names. And by the time I was around uh, as a child, it looked like that. The Center Theater, uh, and uh, it uh, closed in January 1983, and I remember passing by uh, uh, long after the theater had closed. Uh, and the marquee was still up, uh, but it, it uh, was abandoned. So there were other places that you could go many years ago. The Jacksonville Coliseum, now I graduated. Forest High School, now called Westside High School. I graduated high school in a ceremony inside the Jacksonville Coliseum in 1993. Uh, you name it, it happened there. Graduations, circuses, concerts, you name it, it happened at the Coliseum. Uh, opened in 1960, it closed later on, it was bulldozed to be replaced by the arena, and here's another memory, the Civic Auditorium and Exhibit Hall. You know, back years ago, uh, before the Times Union Center for the Performing Arts, this is known as the Civic Auditorium, and uh, told my dad one time and said, you know, that is the most utilitarian building I've ever seen. He said, well, what do you mean by utilitarian? I said, well, if you notice all the windows and as many doors as there are, it was very much a functional auditorium uh, and exhibit hall. Now, let's look, as we start to look, at shopping in downtown Jacksonville back many years ago. In 1912, renowned Jacksonville architect Henry J. Clutho designed the St. James Building. From 1912 until the early 1980s, it, it housed a department store. The first it was the Cohen Brothers department store. Later on, it became May Cohen's. Uh, and uh, so uh, Hemi Park was the epicenter of shopping activity in Jacksonville uh, at this time, at least until the 1960s. Uh, and so amidst all of this, we have the uh, old independent life building that I talked about previously, the J.C. Penney store uh, and the bandstand. Uh, and we have behind that the Robert Meyer Hotel, which was built in 1959. Uh, in front there, we have the F.W. Woolworth uh, Five and Dime, where a uh, sit-in to protest segregated lunch counters occurred that had a very violent, uh, there was a violent incident. This happened many years ago. Uh, so uh, this 
is what Hemming Park looked like uh, back in the early 1960s. Uh, and now we'll take a look also at Hemming Park with the Universal Marion Building in the background. Uh, and of course, the May Cohen's. And, uh, you know, one last look at downtown uh, back in the 1950s uh, as really a, a big time shopping destination. W.T. Grant. I don't remember uh, the W.T. Grant store. Uh, people will talk uh, from time to time about going to W.T. Grant. They talk about the Morrison's Cafeteria. Never had those opportunities, though I do remember May Cohen's. I do remember Ivy's. Uh, and uh, things changed in the 1960s. You know, the Regency Square Mall was built. Malls were built all over Duval County, and it offered people an opportunity to shop uh, and uh, to shop in a climate-controlled environment. You could park your car and just walk inside an air-conditioned uh, or heated building, depending upon what the weather was like from day to day. Uh, you would walk around and shop in comfort. Uh, not really, you wouldn't be out in the elements, you wouldn't be on the sidewalk. Uh, downtown, what was going on in downtown in the early 1980s had a lot to do with uh, why things changed. There was the push and the pull, you might say. I mean, uh, it's hard to shop if they're just ripping up uh, asphalt uh, and put, put barricades everywhere. And, you know, one thing you see is a commonality in life. Uh, is you see those barricades, you see pavement ripped up, you see a lot of money spent on things, but a lot of things, though, don't ever really seem to really change. We now know it as the Prime Osborne Convention Center, but when it opened in 1919 as Jacksonville Union Terminal, it was a big rail station. Trains from all over converged at this train station. Uh, there had been a prior train station uh, before this big one was constructed. And you can see all the cars and the streetcar and all of the traffic right there in front of the terminal. We see here the original rail span and the first roadway crossing in Jacksonville. This is the Acosta Bridge, the old Acosta Bridge road span and rail spans, uh, named after St. Elmo Acosta. He went by the nickname Chick. Uh, and uh, you can see here uh, with the, the new rail span uh, built in 1925, along with uh, the roadway bridge was built, uh, it was built in the early 1920s. Uh, and uh, I remember riding over the old span. It was narrow. Uh, it was a drawbridge. And in the time that uh, I was uh, able to enjoy it, the color of the bridge span of the roadway span was orange. So uh, this is how I remember the Acosta Bridge. In the distance, you see the Fuller Warren Interstate 95 Bridge. Uh, this uh, bridge uh, linked up uh, Jacksonville uh, with what was then known as South Jacksonville. And uh, so uh, it was something that was critical because before that, you either had to take a train or you had to take a ferry. Okay, another bridge would be constructed named in honor of a long-serving mayor, of Jacksonville in the 20th century, John Thomas Alsop Jr. But despite uh, this name uh, that was bestowed upon uh, this new bridge that was to be built in 1941, uh, it, we have always seemed to have known it as the Main Street Bridge, built in 1941. Uh, and as you can see on the dedication day, looks like it had been uh, somewhat rainy. Uh, and you can see from here, you can see when you look out uh, towards, the, uh, towards the South Bank, uh, you can see uh, that there were shipyards. Uh, there was a lot of uh, shipping that was going on on the St. John's River. Later on, you see it uh, painted blue. And uh, you see some of the uh, 
old cars, an old bus, the old street lights. And notice how there isn't a ramp that takes you off onto another street. You are literally uh, can go up and down Main Street on the Main Street Bridge. Uh, so kind of an interesting flash from the past. Of course, Jacksonville was growing, and we can see here the approach of the two sides of the Matthews Bridge span as they're joined together. Uh, they're getting ready to join them together. This would have been in the early 1950s. Uh, this bridge uh, is the John E. Matthews Bridge, and it was built uh, in, in the early 1950s. It was dedicated in 1953. It was named after a state legislator named John E. Matthews Sr. Uh, so um, uh, it was unique in the sense that it linked downtown Jacksonville with Arlington. It was all about in the 1950s linking things up, but you know, you can see here, this was at one point uh, called the Gilmore Street Bridge. Interstate 95 was routed over it. Um, it had opened as a toll bridge uh, and it's a draw bridge. And so uh, you have tolls uh, to pay, you have a draw bridge, and so you can only imagine how long it would take to get across the old Fort Warren Bridge. Here you see a gentleman uh, getting ready for the opening of this bridge. And think about all the traffic that this old bridge span was going to hold uh, from the 1950s on until the new uh, uh, Interstate 95 bridge, Fort Warren Bridge, was constructed. And you'll see the Peninsula Insurance Company building, I recall. It used to have a digital clock on it. Later on, a digital clock would be built on it. Uh, these are the toll plazas that I remember from my childhood. All the carbon monoxide, all the heat. Uh, you know, when you ride a school bus, it ain't fun. Um, it's not fun uh, when you have to wait. Uh, and they also, bet this was before prepaid cards and credit card usage and tollway billing uh, through the mail you had to cough up the cash uh, and the coin right there and hand it to a person. It was the old days. Now, there was some romance back then. Now, I like to think of the Heart Bridge in some ways. It's, it's a very relaxing drive to go over the Heart Bridge. Uh, from time to time, if I-95 really stresses me out and i got to get downtown, I'll cut over on the Emerson Street Expressway and get on to the Heart, uh, the Heart Bridge Expressway to go into downtown. And uh, a very always relaxed and enjoyable drive. I'm, I'm sure there's traffic on there, but I just don't seem to be uh, have the misfortune to experience a lot of traffic on the Heart Bridge whenever I've gone it. And take a look at all these old ships and all of this stuff. I mean, many years ago, a whole different thing was going on on the river. It was very, very industrial. Uh, you know, the city of Jacksonville has changed over many years uh, and the river itself is in a way a very much time capsule well you have to pay your taxes somewhere you have to get your court records somewhere uh, if you get in trouble or if you want to see somebody uh, you gotta show up somewhere well back in the day many years ago right after the 1901 great fire uh, the courthouse uh, and later, the annex to the side of it uh, was built. Later on, uh, the Duval County Courthouse was constructed. Uh, and uh, the Jacksonville City Hall uh, started out after the Great Fire of 1901. Uh, that, that was the city hall that was built after it. It was demolished in 1960. Now, if you recall back in when I was talking earlier in the show about the Hayden Burns Library, it's now the DuPont Center. The old Jacksonville City Hall and the Hotel Wendell, both those buildings were on that, that what I would call a super block. Uh, so uh, it's amazing history and how things change. Uh, looks like we have a, a, uh, a carriage right in front of the old Jacksonville City Hall. Well, you know, things change over the years, and the government center, it moved out onto the river. The old City Hall, that's the old City Hall. Uh, the old Duval County Courthouse, 
and the old Duval County Jail. Uh, and this is what it looked like in the 1960s, Coastline Drive. Uh, you know, uh, that area is really changing with the deterioration of the supporting piers. Those cars are sitting over water. Um, Coastline Drive is over water. I decided to only talk about one hotel in Jacksonville history on this show, and that is the Ambassador Hotel. It opened in the 1920s as an apartment building called the 310 West Church Street Apartments. In the 1940s, it was converted into a hotel. It first started out being named as the Hotel 310, later the Hotel Southland, later the Hotel Griner, and finally the settled on a name in 1955, the Ambassador Hotel. Long ago, in 1997, I was on a walk, walking around downtown Jackson, and I walked past this hotel. About six months before it closed, I didn't know that at the time that it was going to be closing. Uh, the door was open. There was a clerk at the uh, desk. There were people talking. There were some people shooting pool uh, on the ground level. Uh, I walked by this building. Uh, now, of course, what is the most common theme in this show? Uh, it is abandoned. Uh, it was condemned by the city around the time that I was walking right beside it. Uh, and no one has really known what to do with this building. It's at the corner of Julia and Church Streets. Uh, we have a lot of history and a lot of, though the exteriors um, are very well maintained, we know that a lot of these buildings, the uh, historical nature, have a lot of issues on the inside. Uh, I hope that in time, we will treasure the history of our city more. Now, there have been numerous revitalization efforts throughout downtown and elsewhere in the city. And I have talked about that with you here on History Jacksonville. Uh, but when you talk about history, you have to talk about where we've been and where we're going. Now, here's an interesting uh, place. The old Annie Lyle School, Public School 4. There was originally a wooden schoolhouse uh, where this building now stands. Uh, this brick uh, building was built in 1917, and it was abandoned in the 1970s. It stopped being a functional school in 1960 when they routed uh, the Jacksonville Expressway, what later became I-95, and then, of course, even later on, they built high um, overpasses over around it. Uh, so uh, it has decayed. It has abandoned. Uh, since this picture was taken, there was a fire. Um, yet it still stands right there at uh, I-95 in Riverside. And you look at it and you go like, wow, what's with that? What could be done? What possibly could be done with it? This is Friendship Park in the 1960s. Now, of course, we all know about the fountain, but this is something unique. Uh, this shows how Friendship Park has changed over the years. Kind of a neat, interesting, um, I guess you could say it was an art structure across the way you see the CSX building. Now it's time to look at our Jacksonville skyline in history. Uh, I want to take a look at two skyline um, settings for you. This is in the 1950s after the Gilmore Street Bridge has been opened. And now, of course, it became the Fort Warren Bridge. I-95 was routed over it. Uh, that road structure, that drawbridge was taken down and replaced with what we know as the Fort Warren Bridge today. So much change has happened in Jacksonville. You know, um, if you look right there in front of the Independent Life Building, look at all those parking spaces. Uh, this was taken in 1975. Look at how the ramp is diverted off of the Main Street Bridge. Uh, named for John T. Alsop, Jr. 
uh, mayor of Jacksonville. But look at the Atlantic Bank building. This is before the FCCJ, uh, the Florida State College downtown campus was built. Um, you see the Civic Auditorium. You see in the distance uh, I-95, the Hart Bridge, the old government center area. Look at all the ships. But you can see where the ships have left the South Bank. Things are beginning to change. A lot of change happening. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Take it easy. See you later. Thank you.